Hi, welcome again back to Briarwood Kids Ask, where we have real kids ask experts questions they want to know about dyslexia, about reading, about anything that is related. Um, my name is Dan Buck. I'm the director of the lower school at the Briarwood School. We're here with two very special guests. We have Emily Hanford. She is a senior correspondent and producer for APM Reports, the documentary investigative reporting group at American Public Media. Her work has appeared on NPR and the New York Times and other publications. The past several years, she's been reporting on early reading instruction. Her 2018 podcast episode, Hard Words, won a public service award for the Education Writers Association. Her most recent project that many of our teachers and administrators have listened to is called Sold a Story, How Teaching Kids to Read Went So Wrong has won multiple awards, including an Investigative Reporters and Editors Award, a National Edward R. Murrow Award, a Third Coast Impact Award, and a Peabody nomination. It's amazing. Emily's based in Washington, D.C. She's a graduate of Amherst College. Then we have here Madison, a fifth grade student at the Briarwood School. So if you give me a moment, I'm going to move the monitor, and then you're free to ask away. Okay. Great. Hi. Right. Okay, Madison. Hi, everybody. What does a day in your job look like? <gasps> wow. You know, it varies a lot. Right now, I'm talking to you from a hotel because I'm traveling. So I live in right outside of Washington, D.C., and I work from my house. So on most days, I'm at my house, and I'm getting up in the morning, and I have interviews to do. I have things to write. I have uh, things to record. I go downstairs to my basement and I have a closet down there that I record things in when I need to be on the radio or on a podcast. But then I spend a lot of my time tra um, traveling. So right now I'm traveling, I'm in Minnesota and I was here um, doing a presentation yesterday related to some of the reporting that I've done on reading. So sometimes I'm giving talks or presentations about the reporting I've done. And sometimes I'm going out and doing interviews, visiting schools, talking to parents, talking to teachers, talking to kids. I've gotten an, an, an opportunity to interview a lot of kids over the past few years, and I, I love that about my job. Why did you become interested in reading instruction? That is a really good question. So I didn't think very much about how kids learn to read and how they're being taught. I think I was one of those kids who learned to read pretty easily. And there are some kids who learn to read pretty easily. They don't need a lot of instruction. And one of the things that I didn't know is that there are actually a lot of people who struggle to learn how to read, including really, really smart people. So this doesn't have to do with intelligence, right? There are just some people who learn to read much more easily than others. And the difference can often be not just their own proclivities or their own sort of whether or not it's easy for you, but what kind of instruction you get in school. And I hadn't really thought very much about that. I think because I learn pretty easily, some of us sort of learn easily kind of no matter how we're taught. And I have two kids, I have two boys, and they're now older. They're now 20 and 23. One's in college and one's graduated from college. But when they were little boys and they went off to school, I just didn't think, I didn't think about how they were going to be taught to read. I didn't think about whether they were going to be taught to read in school. I just assumed that they would, and they did. I think they were a little bit like me. It wasn't that hard for them. It didn't really matter how they were taught. And then what happened, Madison, is like a few years ago, about six years ago now, I was interviewing all these college students and they were telling me about their struggles with reading and writing and spelling. And I was like, oh, I've never really thought about that. And here they are in college. They graduated from high school, but they were in college. And this was really hard for them because many of these students had never gotten very good instruction in how to read and spell. And now they were in college and it was really hard for them to get through a lot of the material that they needed to in college. Um, and so I started wondering about what had happened. Like why hadn't those students gotten better instruction in school? And so that was really what took me way, way back. I started sort of going back in time and thinking, okay, well, what about when kids are just starting school? How are they being taught to read? What do we know about how kids learn to read and what they need to be taught? And that's when I started discovering that there's all this really, really interesting research about this. So I started reading a lot about that. I started interviewing a lot of people and that's really where all of this began. Um, what did you give the idea that something was wrong with the way kids are taught reading now? Good question. Um, first, I think it was through 
talking to a lot of parents. So one of the things that I didn't know anything about when I started all of this a few years ago, when I was talking to those college students I was referring to a moment ago, is I really didn't know anything about dyslexia. And I didn't even think I knew anyone with dyslexia, but of course I do. We all do, right? And I've, I've, I've learned that some people that are close to me have dyslexia, but I, and I didn't know that about them. And so I started learning a whole lot about dyslexia and that's really where this started. And I started talking to a lot of parents of kids with dyslexia and they started telling me the same story, like over and over again, I was talking to parents all over the country and all kinds of different states and they were all telling me the same story. And the story was that their kid went to school and they had a really hard time learning how to read. And the parents would go to the school and say, hey, my kid is really struggling. And in many cases, the school would say to them, don't worry about it, it's gonna be fine. Just make sure you have lots of books at home, make sure you read lots of books to him and her, everything's gonna be fine. But it wasn't, it didn't work out. And that was really when I started getting interested in all of the research about reading and how it works and what kind of instruction kids really need, especially kids who just don't take to reading easily. And that was when I really realized that in a lot of schools, kids actually aren't being taught what they need to know about how written language works to become good readers. And some kids are fine because they don't need much instruction or their parents end up taking care of the problem, right? Their parents realize, oh, something's going on here. They may go to the school and kind of get a little frustrated by that answer, like everything's gonna be fine. And eventually if the parents have the money at the time and often the money to do things like pay for private tutoring or pay for specialized schools, they can figure out a way for their kid who's really struggling with reading to learn how to read. But then I started thinking about well, what about all the other kids who don't have parents who can pay for that tutoring or pay for those specialized private schools? What about them? And that was when I started looking even harder at like, oh, let me try to figure out how schools are teach reading. I think there's something wrong here. And it became very clear that there was by talking to lots of parents, by then talking to lots of teachers, by talking to people in colleges of education about how they prepare teachers to teach reading. What I realized is there was this big kind of gap between all that's been learned about reading and how it works, and then how teachers are prepared to teach kids to read. And too many teachers start teaching and they really don't know how to teach kids to read. And that's where my reporting sort of went, trying to understand and expose all of that. How did you figure out there was a big finding that gave you your aha moment of like you figured it out? My aha moments. Oh, that's such a good reporter question, by the way. Those are the kind of question I ask all the time. Tell me about a moment in time that was like where you understood this in a new way. I think one moment was the meeting those college students. There was actually one student in particular. Her name was Sarah. And I interviewed her in the winter of 2016 during this ice storm in Connecticut. She was one of the people who had been in one of those college classes that um, where I had met her professor actually. And her professor said, you know, there was this student named Sarah that I had years ago. And she was clearly like really smart and really bright. And she was in college because she knew she wanted to be a nurse, but she was really struggling with reading and spelling. And she wasn't gonna be able to sort of get out of these like these basic English classes that she needed to pass in college to be able to go on to become a nurse. And so this professor that she had, had basically, petitioned the department and said, we've got to come up with some kind of assessment for Sarah because I know she's going to be a great nurse. And these, the troubles she's having with reading and writing are really like, she's not gonna be able to get out of this class. She's not gonna be able to pass. So they came up with this alternative way for Sarah and the professor had lost track of Sarah after that. She had no idea what had happened to her. And then one day this professor was years later was getting surgery and she woke up and her nurse was Sarah. And so somehow this woman who had had all these troubles with reading and writing and spelling had gotten to be a nurse. And so I thought as a reporter, I was like, oh, I wanna find out about Sarah. And so the professor found an old email address and I wrote to her and I did this long interview with Sarah on this day. So she had gotten through college, she was already a nurse and she sort of told me her whole story about how no one really ever taught her how to read and how it was such a struggle for her. And I think that was really uh, the big moment that started all of this. And then I started talking to all the parents, as I just said, and then I started talking to a lot of teachers and then I started talking to a lot of kids. And here I am six years later, 
still doing the same thing. What was your most favorite project that you've done and why? Well, I've been an education reporter for a long time. So before I got interested in this reading stuff, I was doing a lot of other reporting about education. So I've been doing this since 2008. Um, and I didn't get interested in, in this reading stuff until like 2016, 2017. So now I have to think about all the projects I've done. But I have to say that this reading stuff is definitely the best. It's been the most important to me because it's had a really big impact. A lot of people, uh, I think, are really learning things that they didn't know. Parents, teachers, school administrators, policymakers, a lot of people really are having an aha moment when they listen to this reporting. So I think that's, this is my favorite project now. It's been many projects, but this most recent podcast uh, sold a story that came out about a year ago, um, has had a really, really big impact. And it was really, it was really hard it's actually really hard to make and this is something to let everyone know is that sometimes the things that are most worth it um, are the hardest to do so the process of actually making it wasn't always fun <laughs> there were moments when i wanted to give up uh, but i got through it and it and it it's definitely my favorite even though the moments when i was working on it sometimes felt like some of the absolute hardest most difficult moments of my working life um, now I feel really grateful that I pursued through. I had a really good team of people who worked with me on it and, and we were able to do it and it's had a huge impact. So I think Sold a Story is probably the best story I've ever done. How has being famous changed your life? <laughs> well, I'm kind of famous in a small world. It's not like really being famous. It's not like being famous like Taylor Swift or anything like that. So one of the things I've noticed is that it, being famous, I think is kind of difficult when you're recognized, it's kind of hard. So like I can still walk around the streets and no one knows who I am. But when I go to like an education conference or I go into schools, people do know who I am. So I get a little taste of actually how it can be kind of hard to be famous. And you know, one of the things that's been hard about being you know, a little bit famous as an education reporter is that when you're a reporter, you like to be an observer of things and a questioner of things. And you aren't trying to be a part of the story that you're telling. You are trying to tell a story about other things and you're not really part of it. And it's been hard because I've become kind of part of this story. Um, and that's because the work has had a lot of impact, but that's actually kind of a hard thing to figure out as a journalist, how to sort of be part of a story that you're covering. So. It's been fun in some ways, and I feel really grateful. Uh, I feel a lot of gratitude about the impact that the work has clearly had on a lot of people's lives. Um, but not every aspect of it has been fun or easy. It's been kind of challenging. Where have you, where have you been to tell your story, and where was which was the most fun and why? Well, I got to go to New Zealand this past summer. So New Zealand is like the other side of the world, a really big, long uh, airplane trip. So that was the mo that was the furthest I've ever been to talk about my work. I was there to talk at two conferences um, and there's a lot of interest in New Zealand. There's actually a lot of interest in this topic all over the world, all over the English speaking world in particular. You know, there are some things about learning how to read and write English that are especially challenging, which I think is one of the reasons why it's been hard to get reading instruction right, because there's actually quite a bit to know to become a good reader and writer of English. And there's quite a bit for teachers to know in terms of how to teach it. And there's quite a bit to disagree about in terms of how to teach it because it's complicated to teach. Um, so it's been great to know that there are people all over in other parts of the world because they speak English in New Zealand. That's the first language, although they speak many other languages there too, as we do in the United States of America. And that's another really interesting element of all of this is to think about what it means for kids who speak other languages at home to be learning how to read English in school. But New Zealand was probably my favorite place at, to this, at this point to go. And I've gotten to go to, I haven't counted up, I, I did count up recently all the states in the United States that I've been to, but not all of them were for work. So I need to do a, a little accounting, like how many states have I gotten to go to that were just for work? But I think I only have like six or seven states left to go to in my life of the United States of America. So that's really exciting because um, this is a really cool country and it's fun to get to go all over the place.
Do you have any advice for kids who struggle to read? Do I have any advice for people who struggle to read? Well, I think the most important thing is to understand that you are not alone, right? There are actually a lot of kids and adults who struggle to read. And that if you're struggling to read, one of the things that you probably need is better instruction. Because what we know from a lot of research is that good instruction can be really, really helpful. That doesn't mean it's uh, not, it's going to be so easy, you know, like it still can be really challenging, but there are lots of kids who struggle to learn how to read. And part of the reason they're struggling is because they're not getting good instruction. So my advice for kids is to know you're not alone and to speak up and say something. One of the things that I've learned is that a lot of kids keep this a secret. Um, they're sort of like ashamed or embarrassed about it. Sometimes they don't even tell their parents. And I would say to kids, if you're struggling to read, there's nothing wrong with you. And you should make sure that the adults in your life, your parents and your teachers know, so you can try to get the help that you need. What hobbies do you enjoy outside of work? <laughs> well, I work a lot, probably too much. So I probably need more hobbies. One of the things I loved was raising my kids. And I did a lot. I spent a lot of time with them and went to their sporting games and all that. And I don't have as much of that in my life anymore because my kids don't live at home anymore. Um, I love to walk. I like to ski. I'm a really good skier. I've been skiing since about the time I could walk. Um, I really like reading. Um, yeah, I read, I ski, I walk. And I probably need some more hobbies. What are your hobbies? I do cheerleading in theater. Oh, cool. I'm married to a theater professor, actually. So I also see a lot of theater and I really enjoy theater. What are you working on next? Well, I think there's still a lot more reporting to do on this topic. Um, a lot's changing. You know, there's a lot of schools are trying to change how they teach reading. They're trying to uh, do things that are more in line with all this research on reading and how it works. They're trying to do a better job identifying the kids who have dyslexia and giving them the proper kind of support and intervention that they need. So I think there's a lot more reporting to do on what schools are doing and what's working and what's not. Um, you know, this isn't easy to fix this problem, um, partly because schools are really complicated places and we're a really big country and school systems are very complex. And so I think there are a lot of important questions for journalists like me and other journalists to ask about what's working and why and what's not. Um, I think it's really important to continue looking at, well, this school or school system is really trying and they're getting success in these areas, but here are some places that things still aren't working. And so they've got to figure out a solution to that, to that part of it too. Um, so maybe someday there'll be a season two of Sold a Story. And what it'll focus on is um, the schools that are really trying to get this right and telling the stories of those schools and those kids and those teachers and those parents. Um, I get a lot of emails from, from kids and parents and teachers who are really grateful for this work um, and who have really, really important stories to tell. So there's still, there's still more stories to tell of the people who are impacted by all of this. So I hope I can do that. What would you do if you weren't able to go to a school like Briarwood, but you needed to get back caught up to your grade once you learned that you were getting taught wrong? Yeah, so if you're a kid and you're not lucky enough to go to a school like you go to, that's what you're asking me? Well, like I said, I think it's, um, I think it's hopeful that there are a lot of schools that are really trying to make changes, right? So I think for too many years, that was really the only option for some kids was to be able to try as hard as they could to get to a school like Briarwood. And there aren't enough schools like that. And not every kid has access to a school like that. They don't live close to one. They can't figure out how to get there. They can't come up with the money that it might cost to pay for the tuition, right? So, um, so I, think it's, I, I think I would go back to the advice I gave earlier, which is making sure that you speak up um, and let the adults in your life know that you need some help and that they're, you don't know, I, I think, I think one of the things that's hopefully changing this country is that maybe you don't have to go to a school like Briarwood, maybe more and more schools will provide the appropriate classroom instruction for, to give all kids 
uh, a better chance of becoming good readers and also do the proper kinds of assessments early on to identify the kids who that good core classroom instruction still isn't enough for and identify those kids and really give them the help that they need. So um, I hope the answers will be provided in more and more of our public schools across this country. Is that it? Mm -hmm. I guess that's it. I'll can I ask you a question? Sure. So can you tell me how you ended up at Briarwood and then tell me why you wanted to do this interview? Well, I ended up at Briarwood because my sister had dyslexia and she ended up here. And for years now, I've always struggled with reading and I haven't ever gotten really good grades in reading. And we've tested multiple times with dyslexia and we didn't figure out I had it until the end of last year. Mm. And then my parents wanted me to switch over here because my sister's here. And so we know it'll work out for me. Hmm. So this is your yeah. first year there? Yeah. Okay. How's it going? Good. Good. Does That's that feel like good. it's really different from what you were getting in school before? Yeah, a lot. So we had a lower school student uh, council election. So, you know, we have a little government here. And I think there were like eight candidates for president or something like that. Do you want Madison is the president of lower schools? So that's pretty awesome. Is so, that how you got the opportunity to do this interview? No, it kind of came about because uh, her mom is a big fan of Soul to Story. So she specifically oh. told me that. I'm like, all right, I think that we have a match here. So that's kind of how it happened. Great. You <laughs> asked really good questions. So Definitely. you think about being a journalist? Maybe. <laughs> you got a long way to go, but you asked really great questions. So it was fun to talk to you. For sure. Thank awesome. you. Well, thank you both for your time. I would really Welcome. appreciate this meeting of minds. And um, we hope to see our audience next time on Briarwood Kids Ask. Um, and thanks again just for taking the time to talk to us. Yeah, thank you for having me. What a great opportunity. I love for the idea of Briarwood Asks. So awesome. thanks for asking. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.